Lord, I call out to you. Won't you lead me to the rock that is higher than I? For you have been my refuge, a mighty strong tower. And I long to live in your presence forever. The shelter of your wings will be my strength. And I will sing praise day after the ends of the earth, from the ends of the earth, Lord, I call out to you, won't you lead me to the rock that is higher than I, for you have been my refuge mighty strong tower and I long to live in your presence forever shelter of your wings will be my strength and I will sing praise day after day for you have been my refuge a mighty strong tower I long to live in your presence forever. The shelter of your wings will be my strength, and I will sing praise day after day, day after day. morning. Let's all stand. As you do, we will begin with our prayer. We'd like to welcome those watching online. We welcome you this morning to Calvary Chapel McDonough. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your presence. We thank you for your mercies, for the mercies that are new this morning from the rising of the sun, Father, reveals that they are there. Lord, that is your promise. And Father, we ask you now as we begin, Lord, to worship you that we would be able to just let all things that are in our heart, in our minds, let them go, Father, that we could worship you in spirit and in truth. To give to you, Father, a sacrifice of praise worthy of the Lamb of God who took away our sins. And Father, we thank you, Holy Spirit. Have your way this morning, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. There is an endless song that goes in my soul. I hear the music ring, and though the storms may come, I am holding on, and to the rocks I cling. Can I keep from singing your praise? How can I ever say enough? How amazing is your love? And how can I keep from shouting your name? I know I am loved by the King, and it makes my heart want to I 
I will lift my eyes in the darkest night. For I know my Savior lives. I will walk with you, knowing you see me through, and sing the songs you give. How can I keep from singing your praise? How can I ever say enough? How amazing is your love, and how can I keep from shouting your name? I know I am loved by the King, and it makes my heart want to sing. I can sing in the troubled time, sing when I win. I can sing when I lose my step and fall down again. I can sing cause you pick me up, sing cause you there. I can sing cause you hear me, Lord, when I call to you in prayer. I can sing with my last breath, sing for I know that I'll sing with the angels. And saints around your throne And how can I keep from singing your praise How can I ever say enough How amazing is your love And how can I keep from shouting your name I know I am loved by the King And it makes my Lord, I know I am loved by the King, and it makes my heart. I know I am loved by the King, and it makes my heart want to sing. I want to sing. Sing, how can I keep from singing your praise? And how can I keep from singing your praise? How can I ever say enough? How amazing is your love? And how can I keep from shouting your name? I know I am loved by the King. And it makes my heart, I know I am loved by the King. And it makes my heart, I know I am loved by the King. And it makes my heart want to sing. my life. He is my life. I lay it down. He is my life. I lay it down. I lay it down. I surrender it all to you. I surrender it Pride, he is my pride. I lay it down. He is my pride. I lay it down. I lay it down. I surrender it all to you. I surrender it all to you. I surrender it all. He is my fear, 
surrender it all to you. I surrender it all to you. I surrender it all to you. I let go and give it to you. Here's my life, and he is my life. I lay it down. Here's my pride, he is my pride. I lay it down. Here is my fear, Lord. He is my fear. I lay it down. I lay it down. I surrender it all. Surrender it all to you. I surrender it all to you. I surrender it all to you. I let go and give it to you. I surrender it all to you. I surrender it all to you. I surrender it.
more than all I see. You are more than enough for me, more than all I know, more than all I need. You are more than enough for me. You are my 
Take my heart and lay it down at the feet of you whose crown. Take my life, I'm letting go. I lift it up to you whose throne. My tongue confess yes, Jesus. that Jesus is the only Savior of my soul. Father, we know that one day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. Father, and we have the opportunity right now, Lord, to bend our knee and confess to you. 
from our own free will, God, from the gratitude of knowing the grace that was given to us, the gift of your Son. Oh, God, Jesus, the Savior of our world. Holy Spirit, we ask you now to give us eyes to see, give us ears to hear, give us the understanding in our heart of this love that the Father gave to this world that he would give his only son to die and to take our sin. We pray in Jesus' name. Bible. Uh, Wade's got a few there. He's going to hand them out. Just uh, uh, raise your hand, indicate to him. And we are back in the book of Romans this morning, and uh, I hope it doesn't seem redundant, but this is just such an awesome section and area of Scripture. We're just kind of working slowly through it, I guess. Um, uh, Before we get started, I do have... uh, uh, a stage update. We have a couple pictures. If uh, Trish is going to put up that first one, um, you guys might have seen that one already. That's with it all out. And then go to the next one has the stairs. So that's what it looks like with the stairs on there. And uh, it's kind of neat. It looks a little less portable because it kind of blocks the wheels and the stuff. And those just, they're hinged. They just flip right up onto the rest of it. Um, but so there, that's kind of the construction of it, and, and now we'll get the next stage. We get a, we're going to get some guys together, maybe the maybe next week uh, or the week after, and we got to sand down all the rough edges because we're handling it, and so there's a lot of potential uh, splinters uh, to get in your hands as we're you're rolling that thing in and out. Um, and once we do that, then we'll start putting the decorative uh, stuff on there. Um, and so that's where we're at. So it's moving forward. Hopefully we're looking at, we're still, our target is the, the first of the year uh, to having this done and then meeting in the uh, gym in there. So um, that's it. You can turn the lights on. And let's, uh, let's pray and then we'll get started here in Romans chapter 8. Dear Lord, we just thank you for, uh, for you and for just being our God, Lord, and just all, all your provision and all that you've given us, Lord, and and uh, that you just care about us so much. And Lord, as we look at your word this morning, uh, just help us to, uh, to know you better, Lord, to get to know you a little bit more, uh, Lord, and, and just, just grow us in our relationship with you. And so speak to our hearts now, guide us, Lord, as we uh, look at your word, guide us as we hear your word, Lord, and just uh, reveal yourself to us this morning. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, chapters 1 and 2 of the book of Romans are about the problem. And the problem is we've all been condemned by our own sin. God says there's none righteous, no, not one. There's none who does good. They've all gone astray. And Paul kind of spells out four different groups of sinners in which we all fall into. Chapters 3 through 5 are about justification. That even even though we're all condemned as sinners and thereby we've earned eternal death, Paul tells us that God has made a way for it, for it to be as if we never sinned in the first place. And that way was for Jesus, God the Son, to take our sin upon Himself and for Him to suffer the consequences of that sin on our behalf. And if we will accept this free gift, this gift that God has offered to everyone, every person that is living or will live, um, For those of us that have believed God and accepted His free gift of salvation through Jesus Christ, we find ourselves in a peculiar situation that even though we've been justified, uh, that even though we've been made just as if we had never sinned in the first place, and so positionally we are holy and righteous in God's eyes because Jesus took the heat for us. Yet practically, in day-to-day living, we know we're not righteous. We know that we're not just. And so in chapters 6 and 7, Paul deals with sanctification uh, or being made holy or being set apart. And this too is finished and complete positionally in God's eyes. It's done. We're made holy. 
But practically, it's a process. Practically, we're in this process of being sanctified or being made holy. And so what does this all mean? I mean, these are a lot of big words here, right? It means that when we sinned, in effect, we removed ourselves from under God's authority, out from under His Lordship. We, we placed ourselves under our own authority, under our own Lordship. We made ourselves boss or Lord of our own lives. And so God basically said, I'm going to buy these people back. I'm going to redeem them. I'm going to pay the redemption value and purchase them back if they'll have me as Lord. And that price was God becoming a man and allowing mankind to torture and execute him. And, and the price was the son, Jesus, being forsaken by God or separated from God for a time, from the Father. And so when we acknowledge that we are sinners, that we've gone our own way, when we acknowledge that there's nothing that we can do to undo what we've done, we can't undo it. You know, if you were to get drunk and get in your car and accidentally kill someone, no matter how sorry you were, no matter how many flowers and letters of condolence and you sent, no matter how much money your insurance company paid on your behalf, no matter how much good you did, you could never bring the person back. You could never undo what was done. And that's how sin works. No matter how much we try or we want to try and do things that we think God wants us to do, it'll never undo the fact that we chose to make ourselves the Lord of our own lives. It'll, it'll never undo that fact that we chose us over Almighty God, the creator of the universe, to be in charge of us. You see, even if we now decide, if I decided that we would follow, that, that I would follow all of God's rules from here on out, that does not make God our Lord. If I decided that I would now follow God's rules, who's the boss? Who's the Lord in that scenario? It's still me, right? Because I made the decision. I'm going to follow the rules. And so in effect, I'm still acting as if I'm in charge of my life. Do you understand? That's why Jesus called these ultra-religious Pharisees who followed the law to the letter. They were perfect in everybody else's eyes. Jesus calls them sons of hell. Sin has nothing to do with the rules. Sin has nothing to do with the law. The rule, the law, is just to test who we consider to be the Lord of our lives. In chapters 1 and 2, Paul says the test results are in. The results show that we all consider ourselves to be the Lord of our lives. And therefore, God, who is the true Lord of the kingdom of heaven, will not force us, us who consider ourselves the Lord of our lives, everybody, He'll not force us to live with Him for all eternity under His Lordship when we don't consider Him our Lord. I mean, God, God is certainly far greater than us, right? If, if, if we all put our resumes on the table next to God, applying for the position of Lord or King of the kingdom of heaven, I think we would all agree that God, the creator of the universe, would most definitely be the right man for the job, right? And, and if you don't think so, if you're still under the impression that you make a better Lord of your life than God does, well, God has created a kingdom for those individuals. He'll not force us to live under His authority. And I, I mean, that's just how awesome He is. That's just how He rolls. He's that great of a God. He's not going to force us. So when we acknowledge Him as Lord, we're made citizens of His kingdom. And not only that, but then he adopts us as sons and daughters into his family. So we will all be, or we already are, part of the royal family, you could say, part of God's family, the king's family. Not because God has to do it that way. That's just how awesome he is. That's how he rolls. So for those that never choose to put their, themselves under God's authority, for those that never repent or change direction or change who they're receiving direction from, for those that maintain their own lordship of their lives, God has created a special place for them. Now, try to imagine this. Forget the fire, the brimstone, all those descriptive, descriptive words that we hear about. Just set all that aside for a moment. Just think about this one aspect for a moment. Just consider this one aspect all by itself. Imagine what this place will be like 
hell, Hades, lake of fire, whatever you want to call it in its final form and fashion. Just imagine what this place will be like when every single being that resides there, whether there are fallen angelic beings who made themselves the Lord of their lives or fallen human beings who made themselves the Lord of their lives. Imagine every single life form in this place truly believes that they are the boss. They're the king. They're the Lord. There's no hand of God, no Holy Spirit. It is completely devoid of God's ruling authority in any form or fashion. Just an innumerable amount of beings sharing the same place, and every single one of them thinks they are in charge. Could you imagine the chaos, the fighting, the feuding, the hostility, the hatred? Daniel mentioned The Walking Dead a few weeks back, and I've seen uh, many of the episodes, and they've come to this point where they're, they're surviving humans. They're more dangerous than the zombies. Uh, they rape, they kill, they steal, they do whatever they feel they need to do to survive. And they do it to the other surviving human beings. Some have even resulted to cannibalism. But even in this presentation, it's, it's pretend, but a pre present, presentation of this post-apocalyptic world, the people still kind of group together. They have little groups, and they still have a leader of that group. And that group acknowledges the authority of that leader. And each group seems to have some sort of code of ethics that they all kind of agree upon and follow. It's all different, but they all have something they follow. But in hell, being completely devoid of God's authority, every single being will do whatever they feel they need to do to remain in charge. I mean, we think Hitler was bad. Imagine a place where every single being there has this Hitler mentality. Fire and brimstone, that's nothing. That's the icing on the cake. It's going to be horrible. Does this make sense? God is the boss. If we want to be the boss, God would much rather we didn't. He doesn't want us to be the boss. But he will allow it if we demand it. He'll allow us to be the boss. But there can only be one boss in the kingdom of heaven, in his kingdom. That's why Adam and Eve had to leave God's garden, the Garden of Eden. You remember? God was the boss, and they were abiding there together. And they wanted to be the boss, Adam and Eve. And so they had to leave. We've all been born into a world where everyone is boss. But God still rules over it, I believe, just so it's not complete chaos or hell on earth. But he allows enough of it for us to get a good taste of it, doesn't he? So God says, okay, you've all made yourself boss. But I'm going to make a way so that it'll be as if you never did. God says, I will give you an opportunity to step down from that position of Lord in your life. You've lived long enough to experience life under your own lordship, and that alone is enough for to realize we stink as Lord. So hopefully all of us have come to this realization at some point, and we confess to God that we stink as the Lord of our lives, and we asked if he would be willing to be the Lord of our lives. And we already know the answer, right? by what he did on the cross and by what he has said in his word, he greatly desires for us to acknowledge him as Lord. And if that was not generous enough, God takes it to a whole new level and he adopts us as his own children. So think about what this place is like. Forget the clouds, the harps, and pearly gates, and gold, and all that stuff. Think about all of God's attributes. His love, His grace, and mercy, and justice, and peace, and everything about God. And He is all-powerful, and He's in charge. He's the Lord, the King. And everyone there, every angelic being, every human being, has willingly placed themselves under His authority. And not only that, we're all family. We're all adopted. There's no strangers. And to top it off, our sinful nature is gone. Our desire to be in charge of our own lives it's completely gone, gone from every single being there. Can you imagine the peace and rest and joy and comfort and love and laughter and smiles? Not one selfish bone in anyone there. That's the kingdom of heaven. The key word in Romans chapter 6 was sin. It's used 16 times. Sin, the sin nature that we've all been born with. It's built into us. Sin, not breaking rules, but the desire to be in charge, the desire to be the Lord of our own lives. That's why Jesus said, if you lust after a woman, you've already committed adultery. 
Because in your mind, you're the boss, even if you didn't come out in your physical actions. Just because we can restrain ourselves physically does not mean we don't think we're the boss. In fact, as Daniel pointed out, the more we're able to restrain ourselves and follow the law, the more in charge we think we are of ourselves. So just like a Pharisee, the one who appears to be the holiest on the outside often turns out to be the most wretched sinner. I mean, think about it. What's more wretched? What's more dangerous? Who's further from the truth? The person who's the boss of their life, they're their own Lord, and their life's a mess. They stink at it. Or the person who's the boss of their life, and they think they're doing a jam-up job of it. They think it's all good. I got it all under control. Which one is ready to turn that lordship over to Jesus Christ? The one that's a mess, right? It's dangerous to think we got it together. The key word in Romans chapter 7 is law. It's used 22 times. Paul ends chapter 7 in frustration because even though he has acknowledged to God that he stinks as the Lord of his own life, even though he's asked God to be under God's authority, he asked God to be the Lord of his life. Even though Paul knows that God honored Paul's desire and God has made Paul a citizen of the kingdom of God, and not only that, he's adopted Paul as his very own son. And even though this has happened, the transaction has taken place, Paul is still experiencing this built-in desire to be in charge, the sinful nature. And Paul finds it so frustrating. And I, too, find it frustrating. And I guess y'all got it together and got it good, but (laughs) Paul and I, and one of you, uh, find this frustrating. No, I know y'all do. And, uh, you know, we have three parts to us. Sometimes it's described like the body, the soul, and the spirit. Uh, Sometimes it's different language on that. But our body is what's referred to the flesh, which has its drives and desires. And one of those drives and desires is to be in charge, to be the Lord. Our soul can be called like our mind, not, not the gray goo in your skull, although the mind uses the physical brain. The mind's like our consciousness. It's us. It's who we are. And then there's the Spirit of God who was with us before salvation. The word was para. It's with us. He comes in us at salvation. And then later he'll come upon us or at that time and empower us, we're told. So the mind, it either follows, think about your mind, you, your consciousness, who you are, what's going on upstairs here. It either follows the leading of the body or the leading of the spirit. Think about like the, you know, you see in the movies a little angel and a little devil or whatever. And that, I'm not taking that away. That's true. There is angelic beings and they are playing in this battle against us. But I think there's relief at times from that. But all the time, there's always a little me on my shoulder, my flesh. And there's a little or a huge God in a little package, the Holy Spirit, on this side. All the time. They're always there. The Spirit indwells us. So we constantly have this feed. So our mind was following the desires of the flesh. It was just doing the whims of the body. The Spirit was with us. He was just with us, alongside us. And we felt the conviction of Him. And when we finally gave the authority of our lives over to God, when we finally admitted, you know, we stink at this, Uh, that's when the Spirit of God was able to indwell us. And so now our mind has this direct feed from the Spirit of God, who's now indwelling us. But unfortunately, it still has a direct feed from the body, the flesh. And so these two are at war with one another over who our mind is following, who our consciousness is following. We're following one or the other, either what our body or flesh wants to do, or we're following the Spirit. He's in charge. And this is where the frustration occurs. Because somehow our mind goes back to following the leading of the flesh. Somehow we ignore the leading of the Spirit and we realize it. And so then our flesh deceives us into thinking if we follow some of God's rules, you know, our little guy says, hey, if we do some some of the stuff that he's telling us to do, you know, we'll be...